Let's talk about German preparations for defending against landings in Western Europe. Now, until about the end of 1943, the Germans intended to fight the enemy invasion fleet at sea. Yet, since both the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine received severe beatings again and again, in 1944 this was not an option anymore. As such, the approach shifted to fight the enemy directly at the beaches and not at the sea. Now, in order to counter the Allied superiority in the air and at the sea, the Germans wanted to counter this by basically two means, namely by the strong fortification and by the Kampfwehr, the combat value of the German soldier. For this, German troops should be stationed in strong fortifications along the coast and provide a defense in depth, supported by additional local reserves. To quote from a report of the German Army Command West in October 1943. The coast and its fortifications must be held to the last. First of all, it is important to use all batteries and heavy weapons suitable for this purpose under one responsibility and one direction in order to smash the enemy on the water, that is to say in a moment of weakness, by fire or to weaken him so that he either turns back or can only land with mixed parts. And yes, the original sentence has 60 words. I guess we know why the Germans lost the war and that the word grammar Nazi might have a more deeper meaning than some people might know. Anyway, there was a major issue with this scenario and it's actually hinted in the text itself. Because there's noted geeignete Batterien, suited batteries. A lot of the German guns stationed at the Atlantic Wall were not particularly suited. One German military historian actually referred to it as a European artillery museum. And this is also addressed in the previously quoted report with some additional information. Material shortcomings of many batteries, which could not be rectified so far. Guns from captured stock hardly suitable for engaging sea targets. Ammunition hardly suitable for attacking naval targets. Insufficient ammunition supply in some captured calibers. Lack of distance measurement and fire control units. Inadequate level of equipment and inadequate performance of radiometers particularly important in the event of expected enemy tactics, night attack or artificial fog. So they are referring here to radar. Of course, this was from 1943 and the priority of the defenses back then for France was rather low. Now this changed in 1944. As such, in some cases there were improvements, but overall the situation at the Atlantic Wall was not the best. Now, the local defenders should hold off the enemy as long as possible to allow further reserves to arrive. As such, it was paramount that the positions at the coast should be held to the bitter end. Now, there was very little discussion about the general concept of a static Atlantic wall and mobile reserves. Yet, when it came to the mobile reserves, there was actually quite a lot of debate. So, let's look at this next before we look at the Atlantic wall. The mobile reserves were surrounded by quite an extensive debate about how and where the reserves should be deployed. The main opponents in this case were Erwin Rommel and Geo Geier von Schweppenburg. This was due to the different experiences of the German generals. Rommel had mainly fought in North Africa and in Italy, whereas Geier von Schweppenburg had experience on the Eastern Front. And as military aviation history and I discussed in a special video, there was quite a difference between the Eastern and Western Front in terms of air war. Now, ideally watch the whole video, but to catch the drift, here is one of the major quotes. Even in 1945, when the Soviet superiority had become much greater, the contrast between air superiority in the East and West was sharp. Western air forces were able to dominate the sky to such an extent that supply routes were practically impassable for German columns during daylight. On the Eastern Front, German supply traffic in the rear areas proceeded almost undisturbed. This also meant that on the Western Front, moving formations during daylight was usually out of question. Whereas on the Eastern Front, the Luftwaffe at least could achieve local air superiority for a limited time, this was out of question on the Western Front. As such, Rommel's approach was to keep the reserves as close to the front lines as possible. Within the scope of his mission to examine and improve the defense of the coast, General Field Marshal Rommel urges with all means on the fact that the enemy attack would be met in the foremost line and cut off. His tendency was therefore not only to deploy as many forces as possible on the coast, but also to place the reserves, including those of the German Army Command West, and the high command of the armed forces as close behind as possible. 
In this way, he wanted to contain the danger of airborne landings at the same time. This was in contrast to Graf von Schweppenburg, who was supported by the German Army Command in the West. He wanted to keep the mobile reserves farther behind the front and once the Allied had landed, initiated a counterattack with a concentrated force. Which of course is closer to German doctrine, but not really well suited for the situation at hand. And this should have been rather apparent after the Germans experience with the failed counterattack near Salerno in 1943. More than the reinforcement, it was the firepower that proved to be the margin of victory for the Allies at Salerno. The day before, Eisenhower had requested the use of strategic bombers at Salerno. These huge multi-engine aircraft designed to smash entire German cities now arrived to play a tactical role over this relatively tiny battlefield. Over 500 bombers spent the day plastering the narrow Batti Paglia Eboli Ponte Zelle corridor, the assembly point for any renewed German assault. Now this was not the only kind of firepower that was delivered at Salerno. The more devastating one was naval artillery fire. And the key point here is that movement against the enemy was the main issue. Since the only protection against sheer firepower of the US and British forces was digging in and any movement of large formations during daylight would be spotted by the Allies due to their air superiority and rather sooner than later. So how this debate was finally fixed? Well, as you might have guessed, it was not really fixed and it also involved Hitler, as Peter Lieb notes. Hitler, however, could not come to a decision and remained true to his divide et imperia principle. Some tank divisions were assigned to the coast, others to Gas Panzergruppe West, where they could only be deployed on Hitler's personal orders. This bad compromise did not satisfy either side and only aggravated the difficulties of preparing for an enemy invasion. Now let's look at the second part of the defensive concept, namely the Atlantic Wall. Although the Atlantic Wall technically stretched from Norway down to the French-Spanish border, it was usually focused on key areas and here we looked mainly at ports. Those were usually well protected. This was due to the fact that the Germans knew that the Allies needed major ports in order to provide constant flow of supplies once the landings had succeeded. Additionally, they assumed that the landing would most likely happen between Pas de Calais and the Seine estuary, which was the most well defended position. Whereas Normandy and the Britain received less attention, yet more than most other regions. In order to build up the defenses, a large amount of workers was needed. Most of them were not Germans. The increasing Allied bombing attacks, the attacks from the French resistance, and the construction of V weapon sites also meant that workers had to be dispersed for repairs and other construction projects as well. Additionally, in some cases the construction was interrupted due to the importance of French production. For instance, in April 1944 manpower was needed for agricultural production. Nevertheless, even though at the turn of the year 1943-44 only about 8500 installations were completed to some extent, it was still possible to wreck 12,247 fortifications on the west coast and 943 in the French Mediterranean region by the day of the landing. At the same time, about 500,000 offshore obstacles were entered and 6.5 million mines were laid. Additionally, there was also a second line of defenses planned in October 1943. These should be located about 20 to 30 kilometers, that is 12 to 70 miles behind the coast. Yet it was constructed for the Pas de Calais area, for Normandy not enough material nor manpower was available. As already mentioned, ports received a special attention. Several ports and important coastal areas were declared fortresses. Commanders of such fortresses had special authority of the fortress and the surrounding area as well, which extended toward the second line of defense. This allowed the commander to evacuate the civilian population, which was used quite extensively. By February 1944, about 300,000 civilians were evacuated. Another way to increase the defense was the controlled flooding of regions, which in some cases led to quite some debates between the Army Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine. In one case, floods were planned by the Army, but the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine noted that this would create problems with some of the installations. The army's reaction was quite interesting. Although the German Army Command West did not close his eyes to these objections, the command of the 15th Army reacted with extreme irritation. I do not share the point of view of the Navy and the Air Force regarding floods in any ways. 
The Navy is dealing in part with considerations that do not concern them. Oh, that was a quite nice response. I probably should copy paste it for my comment section when I get annoyed. At least this one appears to be more diplomatic than some of my responses. Anyway, let's summarize. The discussions about the Atlantic Wall usually ends with the conclusion that people note that it was rather ineffective and for quite some time I actually agreed with this assumption. Yet in my recent discussion on coastal defenses with Drachen Niffel, who is very well read on naval warfare, he noted that the Atlantic Wall in many cases threw away an important firepower from the invasion fleet. Additionally, we should not forget that the Atlantic Wall faced the two leading naval powers at that point in the time and they used their combined force. And the attack on a location that was not fully built up, unlike a Pas de Calais. Nevertheless, the Allies in some cases ran into quite serious troubles like at Ohama Beach. As such, the Atlantic Wall was clearly not a paper tiger nor was it an impressive defensive line, which would have been unlikely because it stretched as a coastal line of several thousand kilometers from Norway to the Spanish border. Now, thank you here to all my supporters. As always, source are linked in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.